Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And today we are going to talk to a best-selling author, Diane Johnson, and we're going to be talking about her latest book called Flyover Lives, a memoir, and it is uh, published by our friends at Viking. Thank you for taking time with us. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. You know, I, when I when I look at your background, I, I have this sense that writers all over America must be envious of you because uh, you you live in the Bay Area and in Paris. That's right, I, and it is enviable. I I have to admit that we've set it up for ourselves pretty well. Oh, that's great. I mean, you know, a lot of people brag about being bicoastal. But this is a bit much. <laughs> by national or, or something. By, I don't know. by continental. Yeah, oh, I like that. By continental. Internationally by continental. I love it. I, I love think it. Oscar Wilde, it says somewhere in The Importance of Being Earnest that there's nothing so reassuring as three addresses. <laughs> I don't have quite three. But. <laughs> well, I. Uh, on the other hand, to, to balance out that good fortune, uh, your, your publisher tells us that you were twice a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, nominated three times for the National Book Award in three different genres, essay, biography, and fiction. But uh, I assume since they don't say you did, you've never won. Well, that's it. I, it's always a bridesmaid. Um I've, I've begun to think that that is my fate. So perhaps it's uh, it's the revenge of fate for being so lucky in where I live. Being being intercontinental, you got to pay a price. I think that's yes. probably and and this is the first time I figured that out. <laughs> I'm so glad. Yes. <laughs> now there's there's something in in my judgment, or I should say, perhaps my uh, knowledge, that is unique about this memoir, and, and that is how far back in the historical story it goes. You begin by talking about folks connected to you, family tree type thing, all the way back to the 1700s. Um, yes, the first person that I tracked as I took, took a look down the on the genealogy, well, did arrive in 1711, captured by the British at sea, and dumped in New Haven. Um, D- and, dumped uh, dumped in New his, Haven. It used to be banned in New Haven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Well, he was dumped and he was a hostage um, of, the, of the British. Uh, they, they tried to trade him to the French for some French people who had been captured for some English people who had been captured by the French. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he refused to go. He refused to be redeemed and therefore stayed in America and therefore started uh, one family tree anyway. I looked at my own just because that was the one I had access to. I was really trying to talk about um, American roots in general, and I think this is because I, I live abroad or, um, I started thinking more about America than I ever had before, and especially about the Midwest. Well, you were, you were kind of prodded uh, in that direction uh, by uh, a woman that you uh, know in France, Simone something, yes. who said something very nasty to you, that uh, you and your other damn Americans <laughs> don't know anything about your history nor are you interested in knowing anything about it. And that, uh, that I think, made you decide to do a different kind of memoir. That's right. That stung me into um, realizing, for one thing, that, that it was more or less true. I, I think it's getting, um, I think that we're beginning to take looks backward. I've been going around talking about this book a little. It just came out a week, uh, 10 days ago. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and I've been struck by how many people who've come to hear, you know, come come to the readings, um, have begun to look at their genealogies. I think a lot. This is enabled, of course, by the internet. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is a kind of upsurgence of interest in 
American history general generally. So maybe it won't be so true um, now as it was uh, before, and the the kind of Americans that Simone knows uh, will be will will not be so common. You know, that is, we used to be uh, made to think that there was absolutely that it was kind of wrong to look at your ancestors. You are here now, and you're in America, and everybody's the same, and so we don't need yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's equal. Everybody has the same opportunities, and yeah. uh, so their historical background stories, their memoir, is not all that important. Right, or even to be discouraged. Mm-hmm. But now I, I think that may change. Uh, uh, she said, she Simone said another thing that struck me as very peculiar, and I first denied. She said, and you think that you're all descended from royalty. Yes. 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 And I thought that was an absolutely silly untruth. But the weird thing is, as I've been asking my friends and people at random, almost everyone admits to having, if not royalty, some kind of hero, some kind of great scholar, some kind of notable artist some figure in the family narrative that um, that somehow uh, ornaments the, the tradition of the family. Amazing. I Amazing. know. And last night I was talking to a group in, in Marin, and somebody said, well, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, um, hid Jesse James. Oh, my. <laughs> oh. And that was their family yeah. heroine. So. Listen, we'll, we'll get back to Jesse. Right now we have to go for, for one of those breaks. And when we come back, or while we're uh, uh, on, on the break, I want you to think about Henry Morgan. This is Conversations on the Coast. We'll be back in a moment. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Fly Over Lives, a memoir by the distinguished Diane Johnson, is the book we're talking about today on Conversations on the Coast. And uh, our friends over at uh, Kirkus Reviews, and this book has only been out a couple of three weeks, had this to say about it. Johnson is a felicitous writer, I'll say, cheerfully alert to irony and absurdity. The unfailing deftness of the prose makes this book a pleasure. And, you know, in my opinion, the deftness of the prose is a very important accomplishment because you've taken this memoir business and and gone so far back with it and and involved so many different strains of of history and personal recollection and letters and so on uh, that to be able to say that it, that it reads marvelously well with all of that stuff going on I think is quite an accomplishment congratulations thank you very much now, there is a man in, in, in my history, and apparently in yours too, by the name of Henry Morgan. What do you know about Henry Morgan? I don't know anything about the actual Henry Morgan except that he was my favorite show on, on radio. I, and Maybe you know the dates of Henry Morgan, but I suppose uh, in the... Late 40s? Late 40s, late 40s yes. 40s, yeah, yeah. I, I would think be the late 40s. And yeah. he, uh, and I loved him for his sardonic um, apostasies and, mm-hmm. and the sense that, um, well, he, he was maybe an early counterculture um, commentator on the, the silliness of the things he saw around him, the, the you know, world events. Other yeah, and media. one of the things that that he saw some silliness in was the the uh, the ardent uh, attitude and approach to everything of uh, people who ran commercials on his program. <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, w one of them was uh, a deodorant by the name of Arid, and his his intro, surely not coming from the ad agency, was arms up everybody, time for Arid, <laughs> and I'm you know, and it got everybody's attention. I don't know whether it you know re reduced body odor, but I loved him. I, for for exactly that uh, that tone that he had, and I remember his voice. It was quite a deep kind of laid back voice, and uh, other people were so different. Red Skelter was frantic, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this is very interesting that you would fall in love, quote unquote, with Henry Morgan in the nineteen forties in Moline, Illinois, which. Uh, I believe these are your words, was at the time a sh very much like a sheltered 19th century world. You know, it really was, and I thought perhaps I was mistaken about that. So I just yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh -huh. uh, looked at the Wikipedia article on Moline, which I think must be newly posted because it wasn't there when I was writing the book when I tried to find the population and so mm -hmm, on. Mm -hmm. But now there's a long article, and it's, uh, it describes Moline exactly as I remember it, um, somewhat boring, but uh, free of bars and brothels. And, uh, <laughs> the, you know, there was no sin, no crime, no minorities. Um, it was, as a, in the words of a friend of mine who also comes from Moline, Yeah. Brigadoon. Ah, yes, Brigadoon. And, and uh, so I, I'm not sure living in Brigadoon is the best preparation for the real world, but it had this uh, very protected, um, even, I don't know if it was affluent overall, but at one point it was an affluent community, too, because of the plow companies that were very prosperous. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the things you remark, it was also a, a, a place in those days where uh, dinner was always uh, preceded by highballs or martinis. Yes. And the conversation around the uh, the table, and particularly when friends came over to play bridge or something, was uh, seemingly always about golf scores. <laughs> so, you know, you, it, it's it's a pretty spiffy place, I think. They certainly made a lot of time for golf and a lot of, a lot of space to golf courses. I know of four, uh, two of which my parents frequented, um, and I think they played every day. My father was a high school principal, mm -hmm. and so he had the afternoons uh, free to go golfing, or you know, more much some segment of the day, and certainly in the summers. Sure. So, uh, and that was pretty much the pattern for fathers. In in Moline, I thought. Mm -hmm. I expect if any Moliners read it now, people will write to me, or I hope they will, and compare some of these recollections. One of the uh, historic figures, or one of the earlier ones that you uh, get to in, in the book, is uh, a man whose first name is Rana, R-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Yes, well, his first Or name, Rene. Yeah, exactly. He In France, he was Rene. And uh, I hope to learn more about him sometime when I'm in France and poking around. When he got to America, his uh, American new acquaintances, of course, heard that name as Rena. Uh -huh. uh, and his brother, who was called Francois, mm -hmm. was uh, quickly transmogrified into Francois. Uh, F-R-A-N-C-E. Yes, -Y. yes, yes, yes. Francois, and uh, those two names have stuck in this very big, by now, Cosset family that that still um, keeps in touch with each, each other. In a moment, we're going to continue this very fascinating story. Don't miss it. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email JimFosterCoc at gmail.com. Diane Johnson, a wonderful writer, a bestseller, 
has now given us a very different kind of memoir. It's called Fly Over Lie. She publishes weekly, says award-winning novelist and essayist Diane Johnson explores her Midwestern roots, boy, I'll say, deep, deep roots, and family history in this charming and candid memoir. An enjoyable peek into how America shaped one celebrated author's consciousness. I mean, this memoir is so candid that it it uh, delves into your angst about your height, which uh, prohibited you from becoming what you really wanted to become, a stewardess, as we now say, flight attendant. That was terrible. <laughs> so, it, my parents were especially disappointed because they didn't know what was to become of me. No, and I like your 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 father's reading the reason for your uh, for wanting you to be, become a stewardess, and that was so that you could meet a proper husband through your travels. That's very fatherly, yeah, very, especially in those days when there weren't that many options for that, girls. That's this right. The fifties, still the madman right. period. Now, one of the things that happens in this book from uh, time to time is that through using materials from the deep past, you you come up with some things that are absolutely startling. And I'd, I'd like you to share with our listeners uh, what I believe is one of those times. It's when you uh, have the, the character Catherine uh, in, in the 18-something talking about demanding a divorce. Could you read part of that for us, please? Sure. Um, this is uh, this is the voice of Catherine writing in, in her memoir. In her memoir, mm-hmm. uh, one day when we were alone, and he had one of his low spirited spells, and rather finding fault with me and all the rest, I heard him a while. I then sat down and said, "My dear husband, you have talked a while. Now stop and hear me." He stopped and looked astonished. So I told him how he had been ever since the loss of our children and had made me and the girls very, very unhappy, forgetting that I, too, had to bear the sorrow of their death and all of his low spirits and fault-finding. I had come to Lexington very much against my own feeling and judgment in hope it would make him more happy. I have borne this unhappy life for some eight years most of the time. Now I am determined it is not my duty to live so any longer. If you cannot restrain your own feeling and keep me keep from making me so unhappy, just give me a few thousand dollars, just enough for me and Charlotte to live upon, and you may live where you please and see if you can be any happier. I don't want any divorce or any noise about it, but if you can't restrain your feeling, let Charlotte and I live alone. I know you have property enough to make us all comfortable. Even to mention divorce at that era must have taken not only courage but imagination, for it was not often done. Mine, in 1965, was the first divorce on either side of the family. Eliezer said nothing, but after this, either he changed his ways or she did not have the will to leave, for she says nothing more to suggest their married life had not been happy. That's, that's for the time, that's so amazing. Yeah. That is so, so amazing. The other thing that that you talk about is that Moline, you know, is an out of the way place in terms of large cities and things like that. But uh, things still get to Moline, and one of them uh, was was something that you experienced, I guess, as a high school girl going to the movies on Saturday, and you saw an incredible disturbing newsreel. Do you remember that? I, of course, it's unforgettable. Um, I was, I, let's see, that would have been in 44, something? 40, uh, 45. 45, so I was 10 or 11, depending on the month. So, uh-huh. so I yeah. was a, a, a very young, and I'm surprised that I was at the movies with other children and not with our parents. So I don't know how that happened, but um, we saw the newsreels of the opening of the camps by the Americans liberating the concentration camps. 
And if, if, if you remember those unforgettable sights um, of the starved people, the piles of bodies, the skeletons, uh, the joy of these stick figures as they tottered out towards the, the liberators. It was a, a sight I'll never forget. And, of course, I have never heard of such. None of us had heard, heard of, this, uh, of this terrible thing that had been transpiring during the war, nor we, were we that conscious of the war at all. So it was a, a huge shock and a quite unforgettable uh, moment of reality in in a, in otherwise kind of sheltered childhood, and 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 the kind of postscript to that story you write, uh, we knew we couldn't tell our parents about the terrible thing we had seen. For one thing, they wouldn't let us go to the movies anymore if they knew. But mainly, we wanted to spare them, hoping they would never hear about these murders that had happened so far away. And yes, it's paradoxical how children do want to protect their parents. And uh, I don't know how we could have thought that maybe the word wouldn't get out. Can we come up to the, the current day and, and how did the, uh, the, the, the bicontinental life begin for you or why? Well, it, yes. It, we, uh, I was taken to France by my husband. He is a professor of medicine at UCSF, for those of you who are in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. and uh, was doing some research with a French colleague who had been working with him here. And then uh, their, their grant permitted some work to be done at the other guys' labs in France. This was in, uh, in the 90s. And so... So John announced that we were moving to France for a year, uh -huh. and and that and that was the beginning because of course we took to it we we liked it very much we bought a little apartment, and thus began putting down our our roots over there. Then one of our children married a Frenchman that was well received in our family. <laughs> <laughs> very well received, I yes. would think. Well, something else that will be very well received into your mind and eventually into your library is a copy of Fly Over Lives, a memoir by Diane Johnson. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.